feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign, a sign Welcome back to FAQ The Madness. We respectfully exercise our First Amendment right to publish interactions with government officials through the unbiased view of a camera. Let's jump into another ref. Recording. This is a reading of the order granting in part defendant's motion for summary judgment. And it says ECF number 91. <laughs> I have been reading a case. And in the process of reading the case, I say to myself, I wish there was a reading of it. So either I can listen to it in the background or, or whatever the case may be. So this is the United District Court, Central District of California. Slade Douglas as an individual, the plaintiff versus City of Los Angeles, Officer Ibana and Officer Wheeler and does one to ten. They are the defendants. Before the court is the motion for summary judgment or in the alternative, partial summary judgment, the motion filed by defendants, City of Los Angeles, the city, Officer Ibana, Ibana, and Officer Wheeler, Wheeler, and collectively defendants. For the reasons stated herein, the court hereby grants in part defendants motion for summary judgment. Background. Factual background. On August 27th, 2019, LAPD officers Ibana and Wheeler, the officers, detained plaintiff Slade Douglas, Douglas after responding to a call from the California Veterans Crisis Hotline about a potentially suicidal individual. Douglas alleges that the detention was unlawful and retaliatory. Defendants deny all allegations and assert that the officers' actions were lawful. Procedural history. Douglas filed his complaint in this court on August 17th, 2020, ECF number one, complaint. The complaint brings forth causes of action for one, unconstitutional detention, two, excessive force, three, retaliation, four, violation of due process, five, violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act, six, violation of the Bain Act, 7. Battery, 8. False arrest and imprisonment, 9. Negligence, and 10. Negligent employment and supervision, ID, which is the same as. On August 1, 2023, the court granted the party's stipulation to dismiss certain claims with prejudice, ECF number 90. Accordingly, Douglas's Monell claims are limited to contentions about the Los Angeles Police Detar Department's LAPD policy, practices, and procedures as it relates to California Welfare and Institutions Code Section 5150, which he alleges gives officers permission to enter residence without a warrant or exigent circumstances in violation of the Fourth Amendment. ID. Douglas's 10th cause of action is also limited to negligent supervision, ID. Defendants filed their motion for summary judgment on August 20, 2023, ECF number 91. In compliance with the court's standing order, the parties filed a joint memorandum of points and authorities, or MPA, ID. The parties also filed defendants' joint statement of uncontroverted facts, ECF number 91-1, DSUF, which is Defendant's Joint Statement of uncon Uncontroverted Facts, Plaintiff's Joint Statement of Uncontroverted Facts, ECF number 91-2, PSUF, and a Separate Statement of Evidentiary Objections, ECF no number 91-3, or evid Evidentiary Objections. The party submitted a joint appendix of declarations and written evidence in support of the motions, ECF number 92, Joint Appendix. Applicable Law Summary judgment should be granted if the movement shows that there is no genuine dispute as to any material fact and the movement is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. FED period, R period, 
CIV period, P period, 56A. Material facts are those that may affect the outcome of the case, National Association of Optometrists and Optici Opticians versus Harris. 682 f.3d 1144 comma 1147 9th circuit 2012 citing anderson v liberty lobby incorporated 477 us.42 comma 248 1986 a dispute is genuine if the evidence is such that a reasonable jury could return a verdict for the non-moving party Anderson 477 U.S. at 248. A court must view the facts and draw inferences in the manner most favorable to the non-moving party. United States v. Diebold, Incorporated, 39 U.S. 64, 65, 1962. Chevron Corp. v. Pennzoil Company, 974F.2D. 1156, 1161, 9th Circuit, 1992. A moving party without the ultimate burden, burden of persuasion at trial, usually, but not always, a defendant, has both the initial burden of production and the ultimate burden of persuasion on a motion for summary judgment. Nissan Fire and Marine Insurance Company v. Fritz COS, I don't know what that stands for, 210F.3D, 1099, 1102, 9th Circuit, 2000. To carry its burden of production, the moving party must either 1. Produce evidence negating an essential element of the non-moving party's claim or defense, or 2. Show that there is an absence of evidence to support the non-moving party's case ID. Where a moving party fails to carry its initial burden of production, the non-moving party has no obligation to produce anything, even if the non-moving party would have the ultimate burden of persuasion at trial, ID at 1102-03. In such cases, the non-moving party may defeat the motion for summary judgment without producing anything, ID at 1103. However, if a moving party carries its burden of production, the burden shifts to the non-moving party to produce evidence showing a genuine dispute of material fact for trial. Anderson, 477 U.S. at 248 through 49. Under these circumstances, the non-moving party must, quote, go beyond the pleadings and by its own affidavits or by the depositions, answers to interrogatories, and omissions on file despite specific facts showing that there is no genuine issue for trial. Celotex Corp. v. Carteret, 477 U.S., 317, 324, 1986. Inter internal quotation marks omitted. If the non-moving party fails to produce enough evidence to create a genuine issue of material fact, the motion for summary judgment shall be granted, ID at 322. Rule 56C mandates the entry of, of summary judgment after adequate time for discovery and upon motion. Against a party who fails to make a showing sufficient to establish the existence of an element essential to the party's case and on which that party will bear the burden of proof at trial. A party cannot create a, a genuine issue of material fact simply by making assertions in its legal papers. S.A. Impresa de Viaco, Ario Rio Grandens, V. Walter Kittle and Company, 690F.2D, 1235, 1238, 9th Circuit, 1982. Rather, there must be specific admissible evidence identifying the basis for the dispute, see ID if a party fails to properly support an assertion of fact or fails to properly address another party's assertion of fact, the court may consider the fact undisputed. FED.R.CIV.P 56E2. The court need not, quote, comb the record, end quote, looking for other evidence. It is only required to consider evidence set forth in the moving and opposing papers and the portions of the record cited therein. 
ID 56 C 3 Carmen versus SF United Unified School District 237 F.3D 1026 comma 1029 9th Circuit 2001 The Supreme Court has held that quote the mere existence of a scintilla of ev- of evidence will be insufficient there must be evidence on which the jury could reasonably find for the opposing party end quote Anderson 477 US US at 252 to carry its ultimate burden of persuasion on the motion the moving party must demonstrate that there is no genuine issue of material fact for trial Nissan fire 210 f.3d at 1102 Celotex Corp 477 U.S. at 233. Findings of fact with a footnote number one. The facts set forth below are taken from the parties' respective joint statements of uncontroverted facts and the stipulated evidence. See ECF numbers 91-1 and 92-2. To the extent that any statements of facts are omitted, the court concludes they are not material to the disposition of this motion. To the extent that any of the facts set below are allegedly disputed by the opposing party, the court concludes that no actual dispute exists or that the adopted language resolves the dispute. In making these findings a fact, the court considered defendants' evidentiary objections, ECF number 91-3. The court did not find any evidence that the defendants objected to essential to finding any facts stated herein and therefore need not reach the evidentiary objections. Finding of facts. The court finds the following material facts are established for trial under federal rules of Civil Procedure 56A and 56G. On August 27, 2019 at approximately 12.14 p.m., Wheeler and Ibana received a communication from LAPD dispatch informing them that the Veterans Crisis Hotline had spoken with Slay, S-I-C, Douglas, and that he was considering committing suicide, DSUF-1. The officers drove to Douglas's home to perform a welfare, welfare check, DSUF-2, at approximately 12.48 p.m. The officer arrived at Douglas's apartment unit and knocked on the door, DSUF-6. Douglas verbally expressed his confusion about the officer's presence, at his home, stating, quote, I don't know what they, BCO, called for, end quote, PSUF 102. Nevertheless, when the officers asked if they could enter his residence to speak with him, Douglas gave them permission to do so. ID. While entering, Ivana asked Douglas if there was anyone else in the house, to which Douglas responded, there was not. After entering the apartment, Wheeler turned to walk towards an open door to a room in the apartment to determine if anyone else might be present. DSUF 9, Douglas emphatically requested that Wheeler not do so and asked the officers to leave. PSUF 103, Officer Wheeler then explained to Douglas that they received a call from Veterans Affairs, the VA, informing them that Douglas was threatening to commit suicide, and Douglas denied being suicidal. DSUF 15 and 16. Wheeler stated that the officers were just there to make sure Douglas was not going to do something like that. DSUF 19. Wheeler asked whether Douglas understood that, and Douglas shook his head up and down, indicating that he did. DSUF 17 and 18. Wheeler stated that that he was there if Douglas needed help, to which Douglas responded that he was, quote, un- okay, end quote. PSUF 104, Exhibit 2, at 3 minutes and 15 seconds through 3 minutes and 19. Footnote number 2. While counsel for the officers stated at the hearing multiple times that Douglas refused to answer any questions while in the apartment, the undisputed evidence shows that Douglas was cooperative and did not ever say he would not answer any questions at this point. Wheeler stated that they were not there to bother him, at which point Douglas then elaborated on his disapproval with Wheeler's initial attempt to search his home. Ivana Ivana stated that the search was for officer safety, and Douglas responded that it was not because he did not even have to let him in. 
Duncan stated that he did not have any weapons, to which Ibana responded that the officers did not know that. After stating that the officers did not know he did not have any weapons, Douglas asked the officers to leave. In total, he asked the officers to leave seven times. Douglas then began making a phone call, at which point Wheeler stated that he was going to put Douglas in handcuffs. Douglas replied that if Wheeler did, did so, that that would be his, his choice. Wheeler told Douglas to turn around, to which Douglas asked, why would Wheeler put him in handcuffs? Then, in a louder voice, Wheeler instructed Douglas to turn around and put his hands behind his back. Quote, what have I done? End quote. Wheeler stated, quote, you're going to listen to what I said. You're going to put down the phone. You're calling 911, and I'm standing right here. End quote. Douglas asked again what he had done. Wheeler then shouted, quote, Put down the damn phone, end quote. Douglas asked why Wheeler was using profanity and cursing at him, while Wheeler continued to tell Douglas to turn around and put his hands behind his back. Wheeler stated, quote, Because you know what you're, you know what, you're calling 911 and we're standing right in front of you. Douglas stated that he was asking the officers to leave his red residence. Wheeler stated that they were not leaving Douglas's place now. Douglas stated that the officers had said they were there to help, to which Wheeler responded, quote, I'm not doing that now, and again asked Douglas to put his hands behind his back. Douglas complied. While being handcuffed by Ibana, Wheeler stated to Douglas that he was calling 911 right in front of the officers, and Douglas again stated it was because he was asking the officers to leave his residence. Wheeler started saying, quote, You know this, to Douglas. Wheeler said to Douglas, quote, you know exactly what I'm talking about, end quote, to which Douglas said he did not. During a continued exchange with the officers about what was occurring, Douglas stated that he had asked them to leave because the officers were, were quote, exasperating his disability, end quote, and that the officers were aware that he had a disability. Motioning towards a disabled placard on the kitchen counter, Wheeler asked, quote, how do I know what this is? Wheeler started searching Douglas, Douglas's residence, and Douglas reiterated that he had asked them not to look around, at which point Wheeler told Douglas to, quote, relax, end quote. While Wheeler walked in and looked around Douglas's bedroom, including picking up a piece of paper to examine it, Wheeler then walked around the living room, which was visible from the entrance where Douglas and the officers were standing. Wheeler stated that Douglas was now in the officer's custody because he was under a mental evaluation. Wheeler asked if Douglas owned any weapons, to which Douglas stated that he had already showed he did not have any, and Wheeler stated that he, that he could go looking anywhere that Douglas might have a weapon, quote, if Douglas is going on a 50, 5150 hold. Wheeler escorted Douglas from his unit to the apartment's building's elevator, through the building interior, and into the officer's patrol car at the street. Wheeler had a hold on Douglas's arm during this process, and at one point Doug Douglas asks, Quote, why are you using the arm bar on me, end quote. At the patrol car, Wheeler stated that Douglas spoke to Alicia from the Veterans Crisis Hotline, and Douglas stated that he did not know anyone named Alicia and did not talk to an Alicia from the VA. Footnote number three. Officer Wheeler states in his declaration that this individual was named Aisha, but for purposes of this motion, this individual will be referred to as Alicia for consistency. Wheeler stated to Douglas that the worst thing Douglas could do was make a 911 call right in front of the officers. End quote. Wheeler later stated that what Douglas did was, quote, against the law. Around four to five minutes after being placed in the patrol car, Douglas stated that the handcuffs were hurting him, that he had, that he had already advised the officers he had a disability, and that the position of the handcuffs were causing a, quote, se severe exasperation on his right side, end quote, and that he had cervical radiculopathy. Wheeler told Douglas to, quote, give him a second, end quote, but stated that he would not, quote, put them in the front, end quote, despite Douglas making requests for the handcuffs to be placed in front of him. Wheeler told Douglas to get out and then proceeded to check the handcuffs, stating that, quote, these cuffs are just fine, end quote. Douglas explained that it was the positioning of his arm that was the issue, while Wheeler states, 
quote, there's plenty of room there, end quote. Douglas reiterated that it was not about how much room there was, but rather the positioning of his arm. Wheeler asked Douglas how he wanted his arms, and Douglas stated that he wanted them repositioned to the front as a reasonable accommodation, to which really re Wheeler responded, quote, that's not how the LAPD does their handcuffs, end quote. And there was no policy exception. Douglas stated that he was in, quote, in that he was in severe pain, end quote, and that he needed help. Douglas requested that a supervisor from the LAPD come to the scene. The officers called LAPD dispatch and requested a supervisor. The officers also called for medical services since Douglas asked for medical attention. Approximately 20 minutes after the officers requested a supervisor, Sergeant Andrew Kang, Kang came, came on to the scene. Wheeler talked to Kang about the, about the situation and explained that he handcuffed Douglas because after Wheeler started checking the apartment for other people, Douglas, quote, immediately got irate and started calling 911 on his phone because he was asking to leave. But it's like at that point, I'm already there. So I put him in handcuffs, end quote. Kane then went to speak with Douglas. Douglas also repeated his request to have his arms handcuffed in front of his body because of his medical condition to Kane. But Kane told Douglas that LAPD policy did not allow him then to do that. Soon, after, soon thereafter, Los Angeles Fire Department personnel arrived in, in an ambulance. The, paramed the paramedics talked to Wheeler, then Douglas, and then recommended that Douglas be transported to a nearby hospital for medical evaluation. The paramedics transferred Douglas to a gurney and handcuffed his hands on either side of the gurney rather than behind him. Wheeler rode in the ambulance with Douglas and the paramedics to Good Samaritan uh, Hospital. Upon arriving at the hospital, Wheeler spoke with medical staff. At the hospital, Douglas received treatment without his consent. Discussion A. There are disputed issues of material fact as to plaintiff's unlawful detention and violation of due process claims, first and fourth causes of action. Defendant, defendants bring summary judgment as to Douglas's first court, uh, cause of action for unlawful detention and fourth cause of action for violation of due process under 42 U.S.C. Section 1983 on the basis that there was a probable cause for detention under California's or California Welfare and Institutions Code, Section 5150, otherwise WIC Section 5150. However, for the reasons explained below, defendants have not met their burden of demonstrating that there are no disputes of material fact as to whether the officers had probable cause to detain Douglas. One, a reasonable jury could find that the officers did not have probable cause to detain Douglas under WIC Section 5150. WIC Section 5150A provides that, quote, when a person as a result of mental health disorder is a danger to others or to themselves, a peace officer may, upon probable cause, take or cause to be taken the person into custody for a period of up to 72 hours for assessment, evaluation, and crisis intervention intervention end quote wic section 5150a probable cause under w wic section 51 excuse me 5150 exists when facts are known to the officer quote that would lead a person of ordinary care and prudence to believe or to entertain a strong suspicion that the person detained is mentally disordered and is a danger to himself or herself end quote People v. Triplet, 144 cal.app.3d283,288,1983. The officer must be able to point to a specific and articulable facts which, taken together with rational inferences from those facts, reasonably warrant his or her belief or suspicion. End quote. I.D. Quote, generally, a mental disorder might be exhibited if a person's thought process, as evidenced by words or actions or emotional effect, 
are bizarre or inappropriate for the circumstances. End quote. ID. Defendants analogize the situation here to Palter v. City of Garden Grove, where the police received a 911 call from the plaintiff's friend who relayed a number of details to the dispatcher, indicating that the plaintiff was suicidal, and the officer confirmed this information directly with the friend. 237FED.APPX170,172, 9th Circuit, 2007. These details included that the plaintiff was, quote, distraught over a breakup with his wife, that he was, quote, worked up, end quote, because he was told that he would receive divorce papers, divorce papers soon, that he was in possession of pain medication, that he had been seeing therapists, that he owned a gun, that he, quote, he was, that, quote, he was basically like on a suicide watch, end quote, quote, that he had previously talked about killing himself if his wife served him with divorce papers, and that the friend had been on the phone with the plaintiff for over an hour trying to calm him down, and could not call 911 because he was afraid the plaintiff would hang up and do something. ID at 171N.2. The Ninth Circuit found that, quote, given this extensive and detailed information, a reasonable person would believe that the plaintiff was mentally disordered and a danger to himself. ID at 172. However, here, the officers had no such extensive nor detailed information. Rather, there were no details other than a second-hand communication from the Veterans Crisis Hotline reflecting that Douglas stated he was considering committing suicide without any context. Moreover, the officers did not talk to Alicia prior to the meeting with Douglas and only attempted to get in touch with her after they had already taken Douglas into custody. Therefore, Palter is distinguishable based on the information known to the officers prior to interacting with Douglas. The other facts that the officer relied on are in dispute, and as such, a jury could reasonably interpret these facts as showing that Douglas was not a danger to himself or anyone else. To find probable cause under WIC section 5150, the officers must have known facts that would lead a reasonable person to believe that Douglas was not just mentally disordered, but also a danger to himself or others. See triplet 144 Cal app APP 3D at 287 through 288. Defendants assert that Douglas was, quote, upset and defensive, quote, agitated and, quote, angry. Motion at 27 through 28. They also assert that he rapidly cycled between being seemingly calm and suddenly very upset and agitated, quote, was acting in an erratic, often angry, bizarre manner, end quote, and, quote, acted with erratic and volatile behavioral changes, end quote. Motion at 3574. Finally, they assert that they found it, quote, bizarre and highly inappropriate that Douglas called 911 under the circumstances. Motion at 12. But a reasonable jury could certainly disagree with these characterizations in, in light of the video evidence. For example, a jury might find that Douglas's reaction to Wheeler's attempt to search his apartment may not be odd, inappropriate, or bizarre given the circumstances as a reasonable jury could find that Douglas felt that he was justifiably asking Wheeler not to conduct a search he believed would violate his rights. While defendants argue that the officers, quote, had no choice but to detain Douglas, this is for a jury to decide. Motion at 28. Moreover, a reasonable jury could find that Douglas's reaction did not show that he would be a danger to himself or anyone, as a reasonable jury could disagree with the defendant's characterization of Douglas's actions as, quote, agitated or, quote, volatile. Similarly, although defendants assert that Douglas waved his arms around while the phone was in his hands, which caused the defendants to become concerned that he, quote, might become belligerent, end quote, or, quote, the phone could be used as a weapon. Excuse me, but that's ridiculous. <clears throat> Motion at 12. <laughs> a reasonable jury could find that Douglas was not acting violently or in any other way that would justify this alleged concern. 
motion at 27, and there's a footnote number 4. Notably, defendants argue that Douglas's behavior would lead someone to believe that he, quote, might be a danger to himself or others. Emphasis added. But the standard is that facts must lead a reasonable person to believe that an individual is a danger to himself or herself. Emphasis added. Motion at 27. Triplet 144 Cal APP 3D at 288. And it is undisputed that the officers did not have any, any indication that Douglas was a threat. For example, what defendants characterize as, quote, waving his arms, end quote, could be viewed by a reasonable jury as normal gesturing while speaking, and Douglas raising his arms was to further emphasize that he had no weapons and was not a threat to officer safety. Footnote 5. While the court will not point out every reasonable dispute with defendant's version of the facts that they argue the officers relied upon in taking Douglas into custody, the court finds that a reasonable jury could disagree with defendant's characterization of the events and of Douglas himself as acting, quote, erratic, often angry, and in a bizarre manner, end quote. The jury could also find, based on the video evidence, the fact that the officers took Douglas down the elevators with two unrelated civilians suggests that they did not have a concern that Douglas would become belligerent. More significantly, a reasonable jury could find that the reason the officers placed Douglas in custody was solely because he was making a call to 911, rather than a proper reason for detainment under WIC Section 5150, including whether Douglas was a danger to himself or others. Not only did Wheeler initiate the handcuffing right after Douglas began calling 911, Wheeler also explicitly stated multiple times thereafter that his reason for handcuffing Douglas was because he was calling 911, and Wheeler believed that to be illegal. Wheeler stated to Douglas that what he did was, quote, against the law. There's a footnote for six. In his deposition, Wheeler also responded affirmatively when asked whether he believed there is a probable cause to detain Douglas quote, for any other purpose other than a 5150 hold. However, defendants concede that Douglas was engaged in protected speech when he contacted 911, and in their briefing do not attempt to convince the court that making such a 911 call in the presence of officers would constitute probable cause to take someone into custody, either under WIC 5150 or any other statute. Motion at 46. A jury could find that Douglas was detained for engaging in constitutionally protected activity rather than because the officers believed Douglas to be a danger to himself or anyone else. If so, probable cause under WIC 5150 would be lacking. Accordingly, summary judge judgment must be denied as to the first and fourth causes of action. Number two, no immunity applies as to plaintiff's first and fourth causes of action. A. WIC Section 5728 does not immunize the officers. Defendants argue that they are immune under California Welfare and Institutions Code Section 5278 or WIC Section 5278 and under the doctrine of qualified immunity. As an initial matter, WIC Section 5278 states, quote, individuals authorized under this part to detain a person for a 72-hour treatment and evaluation shall not be held either criminally or civilly liable for exercising this authority in accordance with the law. End quote. Emphasis added. And the emphasis is added on accordance with the law. But such immunity is only applicable where the officers exercise their authority lawfully. If the officers did not do so, which a reasonable jury could find as discussed above, then there is no immunity under WIC Section 5278. B. The defendants are not entitled to qualified immunity. In determining whether the officers are entitled to quali qualified immunity, the court must ask two questions. Was the law governing the officer's conduct clearly established? Two, under that law, could a reasonable officer believe that the conduct was lawful? Case v. Kitsap, County Sheriff's Department, 9th Circuit, 2001. As to the first question, although a case need not be, di quote, directly on point for a right to be clearly established, 
existing precedent must have placed the statutory constitutional question beyond debate. Casella v. Hughes, 138 S. C. T. 1148-1152-2018. Internal quotations omitted. Furthermore, quote, officials can be on notice that their conduct violates established law even in novel factual situations. End quote. Hope v. Peltzer, 536 U.S., 730-741-2002. The focus on a qualified immunity analysis is, quote, whether the officer had fair notice that her conduct was unlawful. End quote. Brousseau v. Haugen, 2004. Thank you for watching. If you have a video you'd like for us to cover, use the submit link in the description or pinned comment. If you enjoyed this one, consider subscribing and hit the bell to be notified of future content. Be sure to check out all of the other content we have for your edutainment. We will continue to respectfully exercise our First Amendment rights and publish the interactions we have with government officials. Remember to like, share, and leave a comment. It's the easiest way for you to let us know your thoughts about our channel. I want to be the greatest. Everybody on the face shit. I look around and feel like everybody is the fakest. I make this every day and I'm impatient. Hoping one day I blow up from the basement. Statement. The top is so vacant. I don't hear shit that I think is amazing. Waiting for my day when I'm playing. Sold out shows for a thousand faces. Hey, give me that crown. Get in my way and to be put down. It ain't your place. All this my town. If I want that shit, then I'll get it right now. I'm losing it. The noose it fits. Some loose shit. A stupid myth. You choose to live or choose to dip. You choose to fight or lose your grip and lose a gift. Oh.